welcome to another session of Informally Formal. Our today's topic is very exciting. We're going to be talking about making Bangladesh a regional hub in South Asia. And to talk about this very exciting subject, we have someone who does not need any introduction, Professor Mustafizur Rahman, someone that I've known for years now, and I respect his knowledge tremendously. Uh, as uh, most all of my audience, I think, knows, uh, Professor Mustafizur Rahman is uh, the Distinguished Fellow at uh, CPD, uh, Center for Policy Dialogue in Bangladesh. He was an Executive Director for 10 years at this uh, revered institution. He was a Professor of Development Economics at uh, Business Studies, I believe, at Dhaka University for 25 years. He has a PhD in Development Economics. So without further ado, Professor uh, Rahman, welcome to my show. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. The pleasure is all mine. Okay. So let's uh, go right into our uh, first question, uh, Professor Oman. So do you think Bangladesh has the potential to emerge as a regional hub in South Asia? And if so, why? I strongly believe, in fact, that Bangladesh has the, uh, has the potential to be the gateway to the Bay of Bengal. Uh, if we look at uh, our geostrategic uh, position. My point of reference is just not South Asia, it's Southern Asia, because I think that uh, if we uh, take China, uh, some of the Southern provinces of China, like Kunming, their natural gateway is, is through the Bay of Bengal. If, for example, China wants to do trade, they are now having to go to thousands of kilometers to the east, to the Yellow Sea, and then come all over, you know, down Malaysia, Singapore, and, and, and then to India. Uh, but uh, if we, we take, for example, from Kunming to Chittagong uh, through Myanmar, it's only a few hundred kilometers. So obviously there, there is a potential. And also if you look at the, the richness of big hinterland that, that, that we have, I think that uh, the ports of Bangladesh, like Chittagong, Mongla, Paira, and at some point of time, I think we will also need deep sea port. Uh, I think uh, taken together, uh, Bangladesh could be a hub for investment, uh, for production networks. And uh, in that context, I think the special economic zones could also play a very, very important role. And uh, we should have some of, at least some of the hundred uh, plus uh, planned special economic zones should be up and running very soon because uh, other countries are contesting with, with Bangladesh. Myanmar is a major contestant. India is, is one. So I think that we should have started yesterday, but since we didn't start yesterday, we should start today. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Professor Rahman. But uh, one um, question that comes to mind is... Uh, uh, quite a few years back, we were very hopeful that, uh, you know, uh, for China's outlet, especially for the Kunming region, you're absolutely right, the connectivity that was K to K, right? Yeah. Uh, where, Kunming uh, to Kolkata. Kunming yeah. to Kolkata, exactly. So uh, where Bangladesh and the ports in Bangladesh could have played a major role. Um, but hasn't that been supplanted by Chinese investment-led port in uh, Myanmar already? Yes, uh, yes. You see, uh, many things are happening. And if we are not smart enough to start early, then countries take their own decision. Those decisions may not be optimum. Those may be second or third best decisions. But once they go for those and make the investments, then they really supersede the other potentials. Obviously, China is, is exploring their outlets through Myanmar. They have already they are building their, their roads and infrastructure. India, Kaladan, you know, multimodal transport connectivity. And so, so, but I think that all the countries are exploring and exploiting various uh, options. So it's not that if China has uh, you know, some connectivity through Myanmar, Bangladesh has uh, no opportunity in future. This, it's not like that. So I think that given the volume of trade that China envisages in the next 10 years, Bangladesh is very well positioned, but we will have to have the infrastructure, the roads, 
the, the trade facilitation, the logistics connectivities, the rules and regulations in place. So Bangladesh could be a major uh, hub for transport as well. And it's interesting that we always talk of export of goods, but transport could be a very good export of services. And these services will be there if we can translate just not the roads, but the road connectivities into economic corridors. Right. And in order to have the transport corridors translated into economic corridors, you will have to have the investments, the industrial parks along the transport corridors uh, and, and, and the trade facilitation. So all this together, Bangladesh could be a major gateway. And uh, I think that we are on right track, but uh, my only concern is that we will have to fast forward the activities that we are undertaking. We, we can't really uh, afford to be slow paced. Right, absolutely, Professor Rahman. No one could have put it more uh, brilliantly, I must say. But, uh, you know, whenever I talk about these issues and stuff, things that needs to be done, I think it's been talked about enough times. But I think one area that we do not talk about enough is the reason why things get delayed in Bangladesh is because of institutional inefficiencies. Massive institutional reform is needed because everything gets bogged down because some of the institutional um, practices that are antiquated or are still, uh, you know, legacy of the British era. I mean, we need to come out of it and get to the 21st century. But uh, in any event, let me uh, go on to my next question, uh, Professor Rahman. How will Bangladesh's relationship with China and India play out in this context? And also, are think, there conflicts of interest in this regard? Is Bangladesh playing it right? You have raised a very important issue, in fact, whether Bangladesh is playing it right. Uh, I think that till now, Bangladesh has balanced very well. I think that uh, both China and India, they are our economic partners. Of course, with India, we have traditional uh, relationship. It goes back to our liberation war and the way that our psychological setup is. Uh, so obviously, India will always be a, a major partner of, of Bangladesh. But on the other hand, China is the economic power of the 21st century. And China is interested in good economic relationship with Bangladesh. We can also attract uh, Chinese investment in a bigger way. Uh, also, uh, we have given special economic zones not only to India, but also to China. Uh, so I think that if we can play it right, both India and China could be big markets for Bangladesh. So if we can attract the sort of investment that, that Vietnam has been able to, uh, it's about five, six times more than Bangladesh. So foreign direct investment, our own investors investing in export-oriented industries. So I think that both China and India should be seen as, as our, our friends, as our economic partners, and uh, we should make every effort in order to attract investment from these countries and have good uh, transport and, and, and logistics connectivity with both, both these countries. Professor Rahman, once again, I... Uh... Uh, you know, totally agree with you. Uh, Bangladesh, I think, has played it right so far in the sense that, you know, we have uh, uh, traditionally going back good relationship with India, of course, goes without saying. And I think we'll continue to have that good relationship. But then at the same time, uh, China's investment is welcome. So long as we are very cognizant that we don't put too many eggs in one basket. Um, we know what happened in Hamban Tota. So we want to definitely um, look out for that. And at the same time also, uh, we're seeing a tremendous amount of Japanese interest in investment in Bangladesh as well. So Bangladesh is really playing it very well, I must say, in terms of diversifying its interest. And uh, why shouldn't we? I mean, there is definitely um, opportunity for us to attract investment, uh, G2G investment as it stands and through our special economic zones where a lot of countries now express interest and uh, we're seeing quite a bit of interest in there. Yes, yes, I fully agree. And I'm very happy that you have brought up uh, Japan as well. Right. Uh, I think that uh, as we stand now, Japan is a, is a major 
force of investment. Uh, if we look at Matarbari, many things happening over there, power generation and, and investment uh, uh, parks uh, being built. And, and the Bay of Bengal could be a, a major economic hub for Bangladesh. So that's the next frontier, in fact, uh, for Bangladesh. And I think that you are very right that Japan, China, India, this triangulation could be a major game changer for Bangladesh. Bangladesh is playing it right in the sense that we can have the special economic zones and, and we create the conducive and environment uh, uh, for these investors. So we are having the infrastructure. You see, uh, 10 years back, we were telling that we cannot uh, attract foreign direct investment because we don't have infrastructure. So the smart thing was to attract foreign direct investment in the development of the infrastructure. And that's what Bangladesh is doing. Now it is important that we, we have the regulatory regime. For example, BIDA has gone for the one-stop service. The act is there, uh, but uh, we are not being able to provide those services in the time mandated manner that the act tells us about. So, so those are the next uh, steps that we should really focus on. And then infrastructure, regulatory regime, the support uh, services all together can propel Bangladesh into the 21st century really. Absolutely, Professor Rahman, absolutely. One other thing I would like to go back to, uh, something that you mentioned, uh, the huge trade gap that we see uh, with India, the huge trade gap that we see with China, of course, we have a trade surplus with the uh, EU and, uh, of course, United States, where we um, send our ready-made garments to. Uh, but otherwise, we see a huge trade gap. And uh, one of the reasons, when you look at trade policy, protective, uh, you know, protectionism, um, uh, protective tariffs on all other products. So ready-made garment, the reason it evolved is the trade policies there were very well formulated. But in other areas, Unless we make some, um, you know, trade policy reforms, I'm afraid that our, uh, you know, trade basket, our export basket is not going to expand. I wanted your quick reflection on that before we go on into talking about FDI more specifically. Yeah, I, I think you have very rightly mentioned about the large uh, bilateral trade deficits with, with India and China. But we will also have to remember that one of the reasons of this large trade deficit is that we are importing a lot which are going to our export-oriented industries. I always say that we have a large trade deficit with China and with India. And thanks to that, we have large trade surplus with the European Union and with the United <laughs> States. And also the consumption goods that we are have, having from these countries, both in terms of price and in terms of lead time. Is advantageous. If we were not importing from India or China, we would have imported from uh, maybe UK or Japan or, or, or Germany at higher prices. So as these countries develop, they are becoming more competitive. So there is substitution from one country to another as they export to Bangladesh. But the major problem is, of course, as you have rightly said, is that it's not import that we are importing more. Is that we are not exporting more. Exactly. And that's, that's, that is the challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I uh, once again, totally uh, <laughs> agree with you. But then again, um, uh, Professor Rahman, I would again go back to saying that in order for us to diversify our export market, generally um, uh, your tariffs, you know, protectionist uh, policies are put in place for two main reasons. One is to protect infant industry so that you can grow local capacity. And the other is sometimes to protect against uh, anti-dumping. But these measures needs to be time-bound. In our country, what we have seen in most of these industries, that they have been going on forever. Now, when just common sense tells us, when trade policies are in, enacted in that fashion, it breeds uh, complacency. And our markets have been protected to a point where uh, we need to get world-class, in other words. So, Open trade policies, what it does is it breeds competition, not only nationally, but also internationally. So something to look at long term. Would you agree? I, I agree in general, but if you ask me specifically, I will say that uh, one will have to 
look at sector specific interests yeah, of uh, everywhere countries are pursuing strategic trade policies if you look at uh, even the western countries when they were industrializing obviously they had very high protectionist regimes but you are right that protectionism if it is given for long term uh, it breeds complacency it breeds inefficiency it breeds uh, low productivity so we'll have to play it you know, in a smart way uh, some of the sectors like which are coming you may have to give them for time bound support absolutely uh, and and uh, strategic trade policy tells us that but then obviously you will have to compete in the global market and if you are giving protection the other countries will put anti dumping duties counter veiling duties so it will right. not help you right so right, right. so you will have to be competitive Let's move on, Professor Rahman. We're uh, getting to the tail end. Uh, we got some room to cover, so we want to attract more FDI. So, what are the bottlenecks? What can we do very quickly? Well, I think uh, that uh, we are doing a lot of things right. Uh, I think, especially economic zones, if we can have the those uh, in place and some of those uh, running, I think that can be a major uh, uh, issue because. because uh, the potential investors one of the major bottlenecks for them is is access to unencumbered land so that will be resolved by that the second is the services that that we will have to give the investor so if we can translate the one stop service act into a reality i think that is the major thing so ease of doing business access to services in a within a mandated time so all these things and i think the third is the ports uh, their capacity the turnaround time and fourth i think is the overall governance the perception the branding uh, if you have a resolution uh, if you have a dispute and there can be dispute between you know partners whether you can have quick resolution how your courts are run Uh, you know how speedily the, the judgments are delivered so all those also will have to be in place so governance and institutions infrastructure regulations services all these will have to be in place i can see that some movements are being made and that makes me really very optimistic uh, but then we will have to be very fast my last question to you would be is the bay of bengal do you see the bay of bengal as uh, as the next frontier and are we positioned yes. right to to take advantage of that yeah yes to the first question uh, a bit hesitant about the second question uh, yes it is the next frontier are we ready uh, i wouldn't say that we are ready uh, some of the things we are doing uh, but i think that we will have to do a lot more uh, we have now you know the the dispute settled about the maritime boundaries uh, i always say that if someone asks me uh, what is the area of bangladesh we shouldn't say 144000 square kilometers we should say 260000 square kilometer we should add our 116000 square kilometer in the bay of bengal okay. so that's the territory of bangladesh and that's how we will have to envision as we go forward in the 21st century so that next frontier as you very rightly mentioned that is the unexplored area unfortunately for example myanmar has has been exploiting the maritime you know resources in a big way they have uh, the investments in extraction and exploration of fuel um, uh, and oil etc etc uh, but bangladesh has not been really able to Uh, do that as yet so i think that high time that we start to to pay attention to the blue economy as they say and that's where really the next uh, attention should be absolutely absolutely you know in uh, the years past when i was a director of dhaka chamber uh, i uh, conducted quite a few uh, sessions high level sessions on uh, the blue economy like you say and i couldn't agree with you more that you know that is a hu- huge frontier that is absolutely underutilized at the present time and um, we should really uh, look into that a lot more closely and be more aggressive in um, uh, putting that to work for us professor rahman thank you so much for joining us today talking <laughs> to you is always such a pleasure 
I would like to thank our audience for joining us with an invitation to join us again for our next session. Stay safe and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.